We're up in the loft Up in the loft We're up in the loft Hello and welcome to Up in the Loft, the show that bridges the gap between young and old with riveting and deep thought conversation, underlined by many musical delights whilst we also get a little bit drunk. I'm your host, Jake Baranov. It's Jake Baranov. Jake, 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 Jake. And sat opposite me is a man who's 84 years old, is as fit as a fiddle, and I happen to call him Grandpa. It's my Grandpa, Grandpa. It's great. Hello, Grandpa. How are you? That was lovely. What an intro. (laughs) How are you? (laughs) Worthy of a champion. (laughs) I am well. Good. And over in the tone zone, making all of that racket already, is Andy Colville, otherwise known as the Cola Caparico. It's the Cola Caparico. Yes, Andy is here to underline and underscore this show with many musical delights, whether it be something jazzy. Or something a little bit ominous. Or something just downright stupid. (laughs) Let's take a look and see what's coming up on today's show. We chat to Stuntman to the Stars and Britain's Got Talent semi-finalist Matt Sterling. Andy tells us how he remembers every movie. Each hair is a film. And Grandpa gives us one of his old cinema tales. And suddenly found myself going stiff. And the most important part of the show starts with Grandpa. Grandpa, what are we drinking tonight? Very interesting that you should say that. Here is a bottle. If I show you, it just looks like the devil, doesn't it? (laughs) I love the logo on it. It's uh, called Stones and Bones, and it's a Portuguese wine. Mm. Very interestingly, it was grown in a Jurassic landscape littered with ancient boulders and dinosaur fossils. Doesn't that make it exciting? Oh, I like it. Don't you want to have a sip of this? (laughs) I do. Well, get it open, Grandpa. No, no. It's a truly mammoth wine, a unique experience of dark berry and ripe bramble. Mm. Oh, that sounds lovely. Fruit enveloped in aromatic smooth vanilla and cedar toast. Now, my goodness, I just can't wait. So I am now going to proceed to open this bottle. Give us a good old pop. Here we go. Right in front of the mic. Oh! Oh, that. did you did you hear that pop, everyone? <laughs> that, that sounds was good. good. And now for a little piece of magic. What's that? Our pourer. Mm. This introduces air into the wine as it enters the glass, and it does, in fact, improve the flavour of the wine. Would you like to hear it pour? Yes, oh, I you was. lucky people! <laughs> oh. That does sound good. Oh, that was lovely. Did that tempt you, everybody? <laughs> yes, of well, course. Well, it certainly tempted me. Make sure, if you are listening at home, to pop open a bottle and drink along with us. Enjoy. Um, I am now going to taste the wine, so if you have a glass with you, when I say three, have a sip. Three. <laughs> I couldn't wait for it. Oh. See, I'm getting jealous now because he's he's taking a sip and I haven't got any in my glass yet. Mm. How is it? It is very nice. It's oaky, brambly, mm. roasted, cedary, mm. and moorish. Mm. That's the and one. I'm afraid the bottle's going to stay with me. Oh, that's not fair. Okay. okay. Go on, let me have a bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll let you have a little bit. Thank you very much. Here we go. We go for another pour. Get to listen to another tasty pour with the delights of Andy. Oh, I'm going to have another drop. Oh, gosh, that was good. Make that a good size. Oh, it set me up. There we go. I'll pass that on to you to give down to Andy. 
That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Just a taste for the musician. A taster. Musicians are normally drunkards. They perform worse under yes. the influence and better. Absolutely smash. I'd like to just take a little moment to explain this show and where it's come from and what we're even doing up here in Grandpa's Loft. So I've been in, in the industry for 10 years working in theatre and film. Andy himself has been in the local music scene and circuit as a, as a musician. And obviously due to COVID, we've lost our jobs. We've lost our output on life and we decided to get creative and do something different. Something that's going to put a smile on your face, inspire you to talk to your own grandparents or bridge the gap between old people and have a conversation and just forget about everything rubbish at the moment, I think is... That's important. Yeah, yeah. And so this show really is just about having fun. We're going to chat to all sorts of people. We're going to have many different conversations about whatever we could possibly want. And obviously, get a little bit drunk. How does that sound, everyone? That sounds, sounds very good to me. Yeah. So, have another, have another slurp. Mm. A very famous cook used to do this on television. This was his signature. Mm. Um, we... Put some wine in the stew. I better taste it first. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes mm. good. It is very nice. It's a very nice glass of wine. Mm. It Yes, it's very tasty. So back in 2017, I had the honour of being a part of the costume department on Jurassic World 2. Really? And I had a lot of fun. I got to see dinosaurs. That was the coolest thing in the world. Um, but one person that I managed to pull along onto the set was my <laughs> grandfather. Grandpa, would you like to uh, tell us a little bit about what happened? You mean uh, talk about my claim to fame <laughs> and my once one appearance in a Hollywood movie? Well, it was quite magical. I had given my grandson, Jake, our wonderful presenter, a gift for his 21st birthday. He took me out to lunch as a thank you. He took a picture of me during this lunch, went back to work on Monday morning, was showing a picture of his granddad to some colleagues. And at that, someone who was extra casting or assistant director or someone relatively important saw a picture and said, oh, that is a face we could use as an American senator. Does he act? Does he act? <laughs> he sure does. Does he act? He's a thespian. Of course he acts. <laughs> and uh, phoned me up and said, would you be interested? And I said, when do you want me? But first of all, they wanted a picture of me. So I took a picture of me in a suit. Perfect. <laughs> Arrive five o'clock Saturday morning. Where? Pinewood Studios. Mm. They look at me and say, you don't need makeup. <laughs> and I thought, is that because I'm ugly enough? <laughs> or because I really am that good looking? <laughs> it was the former. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I got, I was already dressed in the suit. They said, that's fine. Yes, tie, perfect, no problem gave me a little badge of the uh, American Stars and Stripes, which all senators apparently wear. You've seen it on television, haven't you? Mm. Even Mr. Trump wears one now, in now. his lapel. Now, now. <laughs> and um, so I put this on, went for breakfast, wonderful breakfast, and then we were all um, told what we are going to do. I was called in and seated at a desk right next door was a chap called Peter Jason who again is a Hollywood uh, well he's not a superstar but he's a star. He's a friend to a lot of the stars. And he's a friend to a lot of, and he's appeared in some wonderful productions. So there I'm sitting right in the front. I speak to Peter Jason, wonderful chap. He says he's doing Europe while he's over here. And then on comes the big star Jeff Goldblum. Mm. Wonderful. He walks in and chats to everyone. In fact, actually, I do have a clip of it here, uh, of the senators. Uh, here we go. So Grandpa's just sat over here. I'm in the corner back here in the wide shot, and then I disappear from the rest of the scene after that. And uh, 
Grandpa, you got some good screen time there. You got some good I screen time. There you are. Look yeah. at you. Oh, yeah. look Sat at there face. with Jeff there. And the most amazing thing was it was it was really loud on set before Jeff came in. And then all of a sudden, the second he walked in, it just went dead silence. Oh. And he kind of looked around and he went, it's fine. You can talk. Hi. Hi. Yes. And in between takes and everything we were doing, look, at any point we were stopping shooting, he'd suddenly just turn around and start chatting away to someone. It was fantastic. And then the most incredible thing that could have happened happened. What happened next, Grandpa? This was when it was all the finish of the shooting, the main shooting. I was asked to stay behind because they were going to shoot a trailer. And I was going to be in this trailer with, you've guessed it, Jeff Goldblum. He came and sat next to me. And he said, I was watching you on the big scene. And you reacted to all my actions. Very good, he said. Have you done any of this before? So I said, only, only on the stage. And he said, oh, very good. And my mind immediately said, Jeff Goldboom said you were good. And there's no one around that's to hear it. That's a pretty it. damn good claim to fame. <laughs> and I that thought, is. that's it. They were, no one will believe me. Anyway, I'm chatting to him. And he said, what did you do? And I said, pantomime. And he said he was a hoofer at one stage. And he likes vaudeville and things like that. And just an everyday guy. We were chatting away. Anyway, we shoot the scene. We all go on our different ways. Well, I was going to say, actually, because um, annoyingly, the shot that they had where they were sat next to each other was never actually used in the end. <laughs> Thankfully, because I was being a little bit naughty, I ran off on set uh, to the monitors to get a picture of Jeff and Grandpa sat next together, which is one of the coolest photos ever because you both look so dapper looking at the camera there. And if I hadn't taken a picture of that, we would never have seen such a thing. Lost. So yeah. Grandpa had his proof. And then I obviously needed my proof of my picture with Jeff. And uh, ah. the vein is out in my forehead, which means I was laughing a lot. And it's because as he was there, so I, I said to him, Jeff, look, I really want to get a picture with you because you're Jeff Goldblum. And he said, oh, of course, yes, yeah. And I lo loved all that. And then he's literally hugging me, shaking me, singing, I'm the man from Jurassic Park. <laughs> I love dinosaurs, I love dinosaurs. And I was just like, what is going on in my life right now? This is the craziest moment. It was, it was something else. It really was. Just as a rider to that, when I said, he congratulated me and said, I did all this. And I thought, well, that's it. No one ever heard it. Well, when we went back to the costume room, Chuck walked past and he said, your granddad's lucky. Why? Well, Jeff Goldbroom said how good he was. <laughs> someone yes, heard it. It was proof. Heard it. <laughs> Validation. And so it was validated. I was going to get him to write it down. But <laughs> I think really there was enough people got there too. So there you are. My, my claim to fame. Your experience with Jeff um, Goldbroom. I'm still waiting for him to ring me up if he wants me in, in a production of his. Um, <laughs> I gave him my number, but he hadn't come back to me yet. No. But I'm sure he will one day. One day, I hope so. Yeah, when they're desperate for a good actor, they'll come to me. <laughs> now, Andy, you are a movie man. I don't know any movie on Netflix, Amazon Prime, or any of the other mm. streaming services that you haven't watched. You're a, you I've got a movies. bank. It's all up here. It's all <laughs> in the noggin, within the hair. Actually, each hair is a film. Yeah? There you go. Pick one out for us. What's your favourite? Uh, gladiators, a few... Uh... I like Gladiators. It's a good one. Yep. It's a revenge one. Yeah. I like revenge. Yeah, you movies. love a good redemption story, don't oh, you? Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah. I like revenge. Definitely. Something goes wrong, but you get your own back. <laughs> That's it. And the people who perpetrated the wrong really suffer. Mm. Oh. <laughs> And I like evil when it's quiet. <laughs> oh, quiet I think loud evil. evil's no good. I mean, when you're really menacing, it's, yes, mm. come over here. Hannibal Lecter style. And I will give you what you deserve. No, <laughs> come over here, give me what you deserve. That isn't menacing. No, in my, it's got to be no, it's not. sinks down and sinister. That's, that's, See, that's this, thuggery. This, to me, yeah. is the difference between, you look at Gordon Ramsay, mm. shouting, very mm. loud, people yeah. are scared of him. Now look at Marco Pierre White. Silent. Silent, terrifying. Calm. He goes, "Have some fucking respect," <laughs> and he doesn't lose eye contact for one second. Oh! And that to me is a million times more terrifying than shouting uh, in someone's face than all the swear words. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. So, Grandpa, what's what's your favourite movie? 
I have a few favourite movies that I like to watch over and over again. I like watching Lawrence of Arabia. Mm. I like The Patriot. That's that one beautiful. I like. Mm -hmm. I like Braveheart. That's classic. I like The Last of the Mohicans. Mm -hmm. You notice there's a theme with all of them. Redemption. The, the good, the the good, good guy the comes out well at the end. That is a genre of film that I absolutely love. But I'm also getting into these Chinese films. Oh, really? Um, they are so colourful uh, and so, how shall I say, stiff at times, apart from the fight scenes, which are absolutely brilliant. Um, but it's the colour, the costume, the numbers involved. Oh, mm. there's a huge uh, amount of The whole people. thing is spectacular. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. I love it. Have you seen that Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon? Yes. That's a classic. Absolute classic. That's Wonderful. That's a childhood memory yeah. for me. Yeah. Like when they're flying through all the trees and they're... Yeah. Looks like they're running on. Yeah, leaves. I've tried that walking up a wall. <laughs> didn't work, um, but it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, well, sadly, fun. obviously, we talk about trying to get into a cinema anyway, but they're all shut. They're all closed at the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, recently, have you heard Sad. about Cineworld have now said in the UK and in the US that they are to close all of their cinemas um, for the foreseeable future at the moment, and that was due to the delay in the James Bond movie that's now not coming out until next year. Due I mean, to James Bond. Yeah. See, yeah, I feel like you can't put all your hopes and dreams on one film. I mean, yes, it must have. Mm. That would have been carrying them through. But then they, there's other films at the same time. But that's one of the big major releases that they probably saw and then mm. went, oh, brilliant, we're going to make a good amount of money off of yeah. that. And then obviously COVID's happened. Yeah, it's maybe, delayed the production. That's it. Maybe they were thinking, oh, well, we're in a little bit of trouble, but that might help take us out of it. And then mm. it doesn't. The thing is, and, and a lot of people forget this, is that obviously it's not just about people coming in and watching that movie because that pays for the people to make the movies in the first place. It pays mm. for all of us crew. It pays for all of the actors. It, pay, it and, and if it doesn't happen, these film uh, studios are not going to have the budgets and the money and the income that they need to make m movies in the future. Yeah, exactly. Oh, the trouble as well, I, I would say, like from, from a lot of onsets like on set experience obviously you do need to be very up mm. and close and personal with all the actors and when you're doing mm. costume changes or whether you've got to do continuity and and and, and there is a lot of f being close proxemics but you know you look at something like the bake off for example mm. they've quarantined together created a huge bubble essentially and it's meant that they can continue on shooting with no difficulty and it's as mm. if everything was fine now obviously when you've got a crew of hundreds of people on a film set, it becomes a lot more difficult. But, um, you know, I mean, cinema was a massive part of my life. Mm. And uh, I, I do remember moments. Now, I went to... Oh, goodness, I've forgotten the name of a movie. I went with a girlfriend called Carol. And Saturday night, I took her to a cinema in the Edgware Road. Now, it was a horror movie. We were watching this movie and I'm thinking to myself, why did I bring her to see a film like this? So I had my arm around her shoulder and suddenly found myself going stiff. Excuse me? Now, <laughs> let me clarify that. Yeah, please do. <laughs> let me clarify that. <laughs> it started with my feet. I couldn't move my feet. Mm -hmm. And then my calf muscles went stiff. That happens. And then it was climbing up my body, and eventually I was finding it difficult to breathe. By this time, uh, Carol was, was, was panicking, and the lights went up in the cinema. The first aider came along, an ambulance was called. I landed up in hospital. And apparently what had happened was that I'd overdosed on energy tablets it was it wasn't um illegal or anything you bought them in a chemist <laughs> <Not sure about. laughs> but i had taken more than i should have done and i hadn't worked as hard as i should have done that particular day and it exploded in my muscles and my muscles started to overreact right and <laughs> If they hadn't have got me into hospital, I could have suffocated. Wait, so did they stop the movie? They stopped the movie and everything. Oh, yeah. my oh, God. Yeah. That was my other claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> Stopping a movie. 
So going back to being on set on Jurassic, one of my most favourite memories is with Matt Sterling. He's a stuntman and he has stunt doubled for people like Hagrid in the Harry Potter movies. He's been with uh, The Rock in Fast and Furious and done a few fight scenes. He's got over 98 credits on IMDb and he was also, uh, a few years ago, one of the finalists on Britain's Got Talent as a magician and a hypnotist. And when we were on the set of Jurassic, he, he and I were talking and I'd been on stage with Darren Brown before. I'd been hypnotized in the past. And as soon as I told him this, he's like, brilliant. I'm going to get to mess around with you. And we had a day. It was a really hot day. And if you've watched the movie, Jurassic World 2, there is a scene, an auction scene, where they're bringing out dinosaurs in this big cage. And that was a real cage that was moving in and out on, on the set. And it broke. So we all got chucked out whilst they were back in to fix it. And we were all out at craft services having a something to eat and a chat and whatever and the whole stunt team were there because it was it was a big stunt scene mm. and uh at this point me and matt had spoken about uh, me getting hypnotized and he was like right i'm gonna give it a go i'm gonna try it and he did and this is a video of matt uh having made me make nautical noises every five seconds and i could not stop I, I literally could not stop. I'm, I'm, I'm shouting all sorts of uh, things like, Arr! you know, uh, or like, what the blank or stuff like that. And he's just laughing at me. And if you even time it, it literally was to a T every five seconds. Like, I couldn't have timed that, that myself. Is crazy. He made it that I couldn't read my own lanyard and my name. At one point, he, uh, I was holding a rope on something on set and he ended up just making me think it was a snake and I screamed and we had to redo a take. <laughs> And uh, he really did have fun with that. And um, uh, I remember Chris Pratt coming up to me afterwards. He was like, dude, was that real? And I was like, yeah, man. He's like, that freaks me out, man. I was like, you should try it sometime. Like, it's really, like, draining, actually. I'm not going to lie. You, As Matt said to me as well, and, and he's absolutely right, when you've been hypnotized or been put in sleep like that, you feel like you've just had about 12 hours worth of sleep. And it <laughs> it's knocks you out almost. And mm. Nikki, my boss at the time, actually had to turn around to Matt and say, can you stop doing that because he's getting really tired? Because <laughs> <laughs> my energy was just petered out because I was basically just a show monkey on set for him. Anyway, I'm really excited to say that we have Matt for an interview. So let's head over and chat to Matt. Hi, Matt. How are you doing? I'm very, very good. I'm very, very good. I'm still in lockdown, but I'm all right. And how have you been coping during this lockdown? You know what? It's, uh, I haven't found it too bad. I mean, I've had times in my life where I've been, you know, two months, three months out of work. So it's just kind of, you know, you just kind of get on with things, really. You know, I've kept the grey matter going by. I've done loads of the house. I did have a, a two-bedroom cottage. I've now got a seven-bedroom cottage. No, I've... I've um, <laughs> I've built, I've built my deck in. I've done, yeah, I've done everything. I've, I've, um, yeah, I've done the garage. I've redone the compound. I've been learning things. So, I've been learning new stuff for the show. When, when we get back into the theatres, hopefully, fingers crossed. So, Matt, you've got ninety-eight credits to your name. What is your favourite film that you've ever done? My favourite film I've ever done. Um, I don't know it's hard because I've had, I've had some really nice. I mean, favourite films as regards to. Jobs have been fantastic. I did Safe House. So I was out in South Africa for six months, and that was brilliant. I had absolutely fantastic time chucking cars around and shooting guns, and God knows what, um, which is basically what we do, you know. And, and the bread and butter jobs when you're doing a fight or you, you know, you're getting killed, which I, I normally do anyway. I die within sort of ten minutes of a film anyway. Um, so yeah, I've, I've had some. I've had some great. I've had some really nice, really nice jobs, and it's it's been. Fantastic. We're going back on to Jurassic Park, so it'll be the oh. next kind of Jurassic Park, really. Yeah, we're going to go back on to, uh, I, I think Jurassic it's the sixth World Jurassic Three. Park, isn't it, I think? Yeah. Sure yeah. Um, so, yeah, we go on to that. I mean, the last time I did Jurassic Park, I had to do a scene where I was laying on the floor dead and a couple of boys were going to pull my legs yeah. um, yeah, away uh, and getting pulled behind the plinth. Yeah, that's right. And then, um, uh, and then I had to... Because the camera was coming around, I had to kind of disappear. So they had planned for me to run, I don't know, sort of 15 metres to a, 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 a sort of a trap door, um, a special door in the set. So the boys were holding onto my legs behind the plinth and they shouted action and I got pulled behind the plinth and then they gave me the cue to run. And the two bastards tied my shoelaces together. So <laughs> I, I was... <laughs> 
I was looking like I'd look. I was looking like somebody had been pushed out of a wheelchair because I was kind of stumbling. And, um, yeah, and all the directors, the director was laughing, the producer was laughing, everybody was laughing. Thank God. So, um, yeah, it was quite good in that sense. So, yeah, you have a laugh with it. It's the, the industry. I've got a mate of mine staying over at the moment, Andy, because he's working on Jurassic for me tomorrow. And we're just saying that a lot of it, a lot of it's changed now. A lot of the industry has changed now, and it's it's big conglomerates and it's um you know the actors aren't as uh, palpable really as they used to be you know and you didn't spend time because it's this big entourage of people you know you'll have you know vin diesel turn up and he's got two winnie vagos and he's got his gym and he's got his security guards and it's just like really you know mm-hmm. you're you're in a studio do you know what yeah, i mean it's, yeah yeah it's strange yeah, it's absolutely not necessary. Abs- I always think of Michael Caine's uh, advice. Um, and I was lucky enough to work with Michael Caine on, um, oh, God, it was called Can You Hear Me? It was about an, oh, an old... Now You See Me. Uh, yeah, an old retired magician. And and, um, and he said uh, he said it was an advice that John Wayne gave him. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, and John Wayne said to him, "You're you're Michael Caine, aren't you?" And he said, "Yeah." He said, "You're you're an up and coming star." He said, "Yeah." Michael Caine said, "What have you got any any advice for me?" He said, "Yeah." He said, "Never wear suede shoes." <laughs> and it and he went he went. What would you mean? He said, "Because you'll be standing in the toilet having a piss, and someone will be standing next to you, and they'll go, oh, you're Michael Caine.'" He said, "No, feet all over your shoes." Uh, so he said, never wears. Oh, I love that. So obviously, you're a stunt man to the stars, and you got into magic. How did you get into doing that? I I, I started doing magic when I was about eight, and I turned professional when I was sixteen. So I started getting paid for it. I was doing people, friends' weddings and parties, and God knows what. Then I was at con- I was at college. I was at Italia Conti, so I was training as an actor uh, and a dancer. I trained I trained for four years. <laughs> Um, dancer yeah yeah oh, wow. i trained in dance i did tap jazz ballet i did the lot yeah i wasn't exactly the billy elliott of contest not being wow. sort of six, uh, 16 stone as my mate says you know you don't really tap you bang um <laughs> but i um yeah i did i did i was there for four years um and then i was just kind of doing the magic at parties and gigs and god knows what and it just started to go manic but the funny thing was when I was doing magic, everybody would go to me, oh, you do magic, all right, I wanted to hypnotise somebody, I go, I don't do hypnosis, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know anything about hypnosis. And then I was working at a theatre, um, which I did one of the shows for David Holmes at, so we have got injured on Potter. Um, I was working at the Beck Theatre in Hayes, and, um, um, and Paul McKenna was on there, and I was working... I was working the theatre, so I was working at um, Prop Corner, and um, and I, I saw his show for a whole week, and I was convinced the first three days that now nah, these people are actors. These this is this is not real. This, these people are actors. Um, I never met any of the actors and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, I got some tickets, some free tickets, and the girl that I was seeing at the time, I said, right, come and see the show. No matter what happens, go up on stage. And she went up on stage, she got hypnotised, and she was the star of the show. And that night, I literally got her back and I said, right, what did it feel like? What did you experience? What was this feel like? What did that feel like? And I questioned her and quizzed her, and I went, right, I'm going to go and do a course. And I, I did a, back then, I did a residential course with a guy called Malcolm Dr- Malcolm Drinnan. Back then, I did a residential course for about six days. Six days? Um, Is that all it takes? Yeah, it's it's repetition. It's it's dealing with the unconscious, and that's all. That's all you're dealing with. It's it's not particularly hard to hypnotise somebody. It isn't hard if if someone is open to it. And the, the question goes to me always because people go to me, "Oh, I can't be hypnotised," and I go, "Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Everybody can be hypnotised because you'd have otherwise you'd have no capabilities to do anything, either you know, write or tie your shoelaces or talk or." Do anything. So everybody can be hypnotised. It's whether or not you want to be hypnotised and if you're open to it. So, Matt, I was wondering if you would possibly be able to do some kind of magic trick or something for Grandpa? Uh, okay, all right. Has, has, has <laughs> your granddad got, has he got a, a phone with him, a mobile phone with him? We've got an iPad. We have okay. an iPad. 
Now, I know what senior citizens are like. Can he use his iPad or is it like giving oh. a monkey a gun? <laughs> He's a technological <laughs> wizard. Is he? Okay. All right. So this is what I wanted to do. Um, could you go into um, Safari? Okay. And I want you to type into Safari how many words in Wikipedia. That's done. <clears throat> so we're looking for how many words in Wikipedia. Now, once you've opened that up, or once you've you found something, there's going to be numerous amounts of websites. But there's a there's a company or a site that's called WikiCount. Have you found that? Done. Okay, so there's going to be some information. Now, let me just go into my calculator. Right. Okay. Got it. So, do me a favour. I want you to just shout out the numbers uh, one by one. There should be a long number and then a, a smaller thousand number. So, just shout out the the first big number. Six, one, seven, five, 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 six. Okay. Now, there's a smaller number underneath, which is a, a thousand number or something. What is that one? 1071. Okay. Okay. So this, I'm just going to show on the screen, that's how many possible num uh, words are in Wikipedia, right? Okay. Now, if somebody wants to help Grandpa, on that website, if you touch it, it actually takes you to Wikipedia, Wikipedia itself. There's like a blue link. I want you to touch on that for me. I'm doing that now. Okay. Now, in Wikipedia, you can put anything in there and you can search anything. So I want you now to think of a famous celebrity. Don't say it out loud, but I want you to put it into Wikipedia. So touch the search and then search for it. Spell that person's name in there. Don't tell anybody and then press search. I've got it now. Yep. Okay. That person now, you're going to have loads of information about that person. I want you to just run up. There's going to be loads of paragraphs. Like you're reading a book, just move your finger up. There's going to be loads of paragraphs about that person and stop when you're happy. Okay. Now you've stopped on a paragraph. Yes? Yep. Okay. I want you to pick an interesting word in that paragraph. Not an in or an at or a the or a but, a big word. Have you picked a big word in that paragraph? Don't say it out loud though. I've got a word. Okay, now put your iPad face down next to you so you can't see it anymore. Good, okay. The word that you picked, the word that you picked, did it begin with an N? No. What did it begin with? L. So you would have picked Keely Hawks, correct? Keely! <laughs> hey! Well, would you believe it? Yes, that is my dream girl. Yes, you must have read my mind. <laughs> Take care, loads of love. Speak to you soon. Bye. So we come to the end of the show, and as always, I just want to ask everyone, how are you all feeling, Grandpa? How are you feeling? Oh, that was fantastic. I mean... That trick, oh dear, <laughs> goodness gracious me. Uh, no, it's lovely. I feel well, I feel comfortable, and I've had a wonderful time. Thank you for hosting such a wonderful, wonderful evening. Oh, well, thank you for being here. Andy, how do you feel? I feel great. I feel jazzy. I feel magicked up. Oh. And uh, I'm out of wine, actually. Oh, so, uh, we need to go and get some more then. I'll have a top up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for tuning in, and we will see you very soon. And as always, we're going to play out with a little bit of a jam. Andy, take it away. One, two, three. Four.